The year was 1955, and the people working at Marine Land of the Pacific Aquarium in Los Angeles were collectively holding their breaths in anticipation of what could be their biggest draw at that time. That potential draw was a great white shark. The four-foot-long, 50-pound female great white was captured by a crew of sport fishermen just a day earlier, just off the coast of the Palos Verde Peninsula in the south of Los Angeles. Marine land employees held a round-the-clock vigil for the shark and did everything they could to keep it alive. Sadly though, just a day later, the shark was dead, floating belly up in its massive aquarium, much like that goldfish it got at the fair and completely forgot to feed. Don't you lie, you forgot to feed it. However, with the shark's death, the hope of keeping one of these creatures alive and displaying it for the public to marvel and fear were dashed, along with what could have presumably been a drastic increase in ticket sales for the park. Since then, aquariums from all over the world have tried to keep a great white shark within the confines of their massive tanks, but all of those attempts have failed, often ending up with the shark dying. There was actually one case where a shark was euthanized because it started to develop a keen interest in making a meal out of the people assigned to take care of it. The best case scenario, though, is that it's simply released back into the wild with no muss or fuss. For now, though, let's focus on that second case I was talking about. We had a 2.3 meter long male great white shark. He was kept at the Manly Marine Land in Sydney, and he showed initial signs of actually thriving in captivity well. At least, well enough for a completely wild animal to thrive in a tank that was way smaller than its natural habitat. Heck, it even started eating properly. It perhaps started to eat a bit too properly, as it started to think that the people that was feeding it looked pretty tasty as well. Aquarium officials just decided to pull the plug on the entire project and swiftly gave the shark a very humane death. Some of you might question as to why they decided to do that, but here's the thing. It's possible if they released it back into the wild, we might have an actual man-eater on our hands. Either way, it's not a good situation. Now, we may have a big question for today, and that question is, can't anybody figure out how to keep these massive predators alive long enough in captivity for people to stare, gawk at them, and buy merchandise? I mean, look at killer whales, they're fine. Well, fine relatively, th that's another script for another day. Either way, you'd think marine biologists nowadays would already have the means and the know-how to keep a captive great white shark from kicking the bucket. I can say this much, though, it's definitely not from lack of trying. More than 60 great white sharks have been captured in the wild and forcefully kept in huge tanks. In fact, SeaWorld San Diego alone kept a total of 30 of these marine predators, and that number doesn't include the number of sharks who died while being captured or while being transported to the aquariums. Despite knowing everything about these sharks, or at least everything we want to know, the longest anyone has gone from keeping a great white alive in captivity was 198 days. Mind you, that's nothing to sneeze at considering the history. But 198 days on display doesn't exactly generate a ton of revenue now, does it? Now, there's actually a lot of reasons as to why the great white sharks don't do well in captivity, and one of them should be pretty obvious. There's simply not enough space for them. In fact, the only reason why some aquariums are successful at keeping a great white shark alive for a few months in captivity is the fact that these captured sharks were all small juveniles. It works because juveniles don't need near as much space as adults. Although, obviously, they're gonna grow up into adults. If there's one thing you need to know about these sharks is that they really don't settle in one location for an extended period of time, though. Great white sharks are known to be highly migratory, with individuals making long migrations every single year. In the eastern Pacific Ocean, great whites regularly migrate between Mexico and Hawaii, and in other ocean basins, individuals may migrate even longer distances. Scientists have actually found that tag sharks sometimes end up on the other side of the world. In fact, one example, over in 2014, one even swam clear across the Atlantic Ocean, which is a distance of 4,830 kilometers between the United States and Northern Africa. They also have a very unique physiology that requires them to be constantly on the move. If not, they'd literally suffocate to death. All sharks extract oxygen from the water with their gills, and to do this, water must move over and past their gills. This is called ram ventilation. Other shark species evolved to work around the swim-around-or-die problem by developing spiracles, a little nostril-type opening behind the eye. They use this so they can pump water over their gills even while sitting still. Gray whites, however, don't have these tiny little blowholes, making them obligate ram ventilators, which basically means they have to be constantly on the move in order to breathe, hence their pretty much nomadic lifestyle. But of course, some great white sharks have been observed resting, if you will, remaining stationary for long periods of time out in the wild. 
Honestly, it's not that these sharks have a death wish. Every living creature needs to rest sometimes, and the Great White avoids certain death by sleeping, staying motionless, orienting themselves to face a moving water current, allowing oxygen-rich water to naturally pass through their gills. Another theory suggests that the artificial environment of a glass tank could overwhelm or confuse these sharks' incredibly sharp electroreception. This sensory perception enables them to detect subtle moves and changes in the marine environment. However, in a tank, it would be easily confused by the huge amount of stimuli from glass walls to electronic equipment, and also pretty much everything else that's surrounding them. And although they do look like formidable creatures sent by Satan himself to terrorize the oceans and all that dip their toes in it, they have a particularly delicate constitution. The water that they're living in should be just right, with just the perfect amount of salinity. Getting this mixture wrong even slightly, although it won't outright kill the Great White, isn't making the task of keeping it alive any easier as well. If, by some miracle, people would be able to find some way to keep these massive predators live in tanks, the fraction of the size of their natural habitat, another problem would be catching them successfully while ensuring that the shark is going to survive the stressful ordeal, if you can catch them at all. Great White Sharks, as I've said before, are huge. The biggest can reach up to 20 feet long. Their size may be part of their appeal, but it's one of the things that makes capturing them extremely difficult. Their size is also a reason why they tend to get hurt during the capturing process. These injuries only seem to worsen when they're relocated to an aquarium tank, which eventually leads to many of them dying. We humans, when we exert a lot of effort by doing tons of physical stuff, like lifting heavy weights or even by running long distances, our muscles produce an excess of lactic acid. This contributes to our muscles feeling sore and tired. Sure, that isn't a real big issue for us, though, as lactic acid levels in our bodies soon normalize and even get absorbed by our body and use as energy. That convenience, however, isn't available for sharks in general. If great white sharks develop a high enough level of lactic acid in their bodies, you know, from all of that thrashing around trying not to get caught, there's a good chance they're not going to be able to rebound from it. In fact, too much lactic acid can leave permanent effects on their bodies, which often leads to sickness, making them less likely to successfully hunt, and also an eventual death. Studies on sharks reveal that a surprising number of them die, resulting from being caught and then subsequently released. The culprit? You guessed it, an excess of lactic acid in their bodies, which the poor sharks were unfortunately not built to handle in the slightest. Of course, another important factor to consider is the stress that's being given to the animal in all stages of its captivity. If it somehow manages to survive the massive amounts of lactic acid in its body resulting from its capture, marine biologists then face the daunting task of keeping the animal alive while being transported to a nearby tank big enough to accommodate it. Unfortunately, the stress of being forcibly taken from their homes usually proves to be too much for these mighty predators. And with only a handful of captured Great Whites dying during transport, a lot of them died due to stress after only a few days in their artificial tanks. Another byproduct of the stress these sharks are being subjected to is that they can also be depressed. Huh, maybe we're not so different after all. While humans have a tendency to overeat or go with comfort food, Great Whites will simply stop eating. Great White Sharks are hunters in the wild. This creates a challenge for zookeepers because in many cases, these sharks will refuse to eat the food served to them by humans. One of the biggest problems is that the foods that they enjoy, like sea otters and other sea mammals, are considered highly endangered and therefore are, of course, difficult. That is, unless you want to break a multitude of laws. Sharks also primarily eat live prey, which can be very expensive, and let's not forget that live feeding is not exactly audience-friendly. Either way, weird interests aside, great white sharks enjoy the thrill of the hunt and become depressed when restricted from doing so. This is exactly what happened to an 11.5 foot male great white shark which was held captive in a Japanese aquarium back in 2016. The shark only lasted about three days in captivity before dying. According to reports by the Associated Press, the shark simply stopped eating. Many scientists now believe that these supposedly cold-blooded, single-minded killers are actually quite intelligent and complex. Although they do tend to be loners, they seem to show intelligent behavior every time they gather together. Being intelligent creatures only makes them more prone to depression. Depression may also lead to the Great Whites injuring themselves, either to try and break their enclosures or to simply end their lives intentionally. They also don't necessarily have to focus their aggression on themselves, but they can also vent it out on others. UnderwaterTimes.com released a series of photos back in 2005 depicting a Great White Shark with a busted snout. This shark was being kept at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and the disturbing photos clearly show that the shark's nose has been ground down into a blunt end, with an open wound clearly visible. The damage is likely caused from the shark bumping into the sides of the aquarium. 
The same shark had already made headlines news earlier that week, when it attacked and killed two other sharks which were sharing the tank with it. The Great White attacked its first victim, a soup fin shark, biting a two-foot chunk out of its tail. It then struck out again just a couple of weeks later and left a six-inch gouge in another soup fin. Both sharks died. Honestly, if it weren't for these two fatal attacks on other sharks, the Monterey Bay Aquarium might have actually considered keeping the shark rather than releasing it back into the wild. After all, this was the very same shark they were able to keep alive longer than anybody else. This female great white shark, which was caught accidentally in commercial fishing nets, was kept in the aquarium's 1.2 million gallon open sea exhibit for 198 days, which is little over six months, and it's estimated that over three million people got to see this mighty predator. The aquarium was actually so successful that the shark actually grew about 14 inches while in captivity. If it weren't for the self-mutilation and a couple of shark murders, it would probably still be there. The Monterey Bay Aquarium seems to be the most successful at keeping great white sharks alive in captivity. Aside from the female that I mentioned earlier, the NBA has actually kept five other great white sharks, which have both been caught accidentally and deliberately. The shark stayed at NBA for between 11 days and 5 months, but had to be released for various reasons, such as becoming too big for the tank or displaying unhealthy behaviors. This of course includes not eating or swimming into the side of the tank. One, released in 2008, had become too frisky for his own good. Three years later, another great white had been doing well before its release, but died after just a week in the wild. And probably the last reason why we don't keep any of these mighty predators in million gallon tanks is this. Now we know better. Rather than constantly trying and subsequently failing, aquariums all over the world have just abandoned all attempts at keeping a great white shark in captivity altogether. A majority of people now consider keeping great white sharks and other animals, for that matter, confined in less than ideal habitats to be utterly inhumane. This is a hard lesson that the general public learned in 2013 expose Blackfish. This damaging documentary shined a light on the mental collapse of SeaWorld's captive killer whales, and considering SeaWorld's drop in sales after the release of this film, consumers believe it's unethical as well. Of course, there's going to be a few unscrupulous individuals who won't think so, and to those people, I say this. The hell's wrong with you? And yes, I know, great whites and orcas are very different, but at the same time, they do suffer from the same problems in terms of captivity. Do we really need to see these mighty fish in captivity? If you really need to, there are actually other options which don't involve any live animals and is vastly more humane. Edge Innovations is a great company that could revolutionize the zoo industry and how we interact with animals. They're trying to persuade zoos and aquariums to display robotic animals rather than real ones. These animatronics are quite cost-effective in the long run and don't require veterinary care of food and, best of all, provide a more humane experience. Granted, though, zoos do serve a practical purpose for certain animals, but I won't get into that one. If these kind of technologies gain worldwide acceptance, gone will be the days of humans keeping animals in small cages for entertainment. Probably. I mean, honestly, I'll just say this. Hopefully PETA would just shut up at that point. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. Like the video if you do and leave a comment, and also make sure to check out the channel's other amazing vids. As always, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Later, everybody.